This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer. On November 3rd, 1973, the Mariner 10 probe set sail for Venus, where it gave us our first close-up look of the planet, all the while lending its gravity to boost the probe's velocity to its next destination, Mercury. This mission gave humankind many of its first experiences with space travel. It was the first time a gravity assist had ever been performed using a planet's gravity. It was the first time two planets had been visited up close in a single mission, and it was the first time solar pressure had been used to control a spacecraft's attitude. But that wasn't by design. This mission came incredibly close to being a complete failure as a result of debris floating around the spacecraft interfering with the star tracking navigation camera. Each time it happened, Mariner 10 needed to perform a corrective roll to reacquire a lock on Canobus, its reference star. And to make matters worse, this occurred more frequently as the brightness of the particles increased as Mariner 10 approached the Sun. Mariner 10 managed to complete its gravitational slingshot by Venus and was now limping on to Mercury, but was quickly running out of nitrogen, the propellant needed to perform these maneuvers. To solve this problem, the engineers came up with a genius plan. By tilting the solar panels, they could use solar pressure, the force exerted by photons, to control its role and stabilize its position. A huge moment that proved the viability of solar sails for future use in spacecraft. And just this year, LightSail 2 provided a valuable technology demonstration of solar sails' ability to provide control at very low cost for small satellites. Before we jump into what LightSail 2 achieved, let's first see how it works. Although photons don't have mass, they do have momentum, which can be transferred into an object with a reflective surface. This is a bit counterintuitive for anyone that has learned, like me, that momentum equals mass by velocity. So we need a new equation to describe the momentum of a photon. And here it is. The momentum of a single photon can be found by dividing Planck's constant by the wavelength of the photon. Since Planck's constant is, well, a constant, the momentum of a photon is entirely determined by the wavelength, with shorter waves having higher momentum. Finding the momentum of a wavelength of 500 nanometers, we can find a momentum of just 1.3 by 10 to the minus 27 kilogram meters per second. That's obviously tiny, but when dealing with the vacuum of space, that can add up when every single collision of a photon with the solar sails provides an increase in velocity of the spacecraft. Thanks to our friendly neighborhood laws of physics, or the conservation of momentum to be exact, which states that the change in momentum of a photon must involve an equal and opposite change in momentum for the object it interacted with. We can maximize this transfer of momentum by ensuring the sail is as close to a perfect mirror as possible, wasting as little energy as possible to the heating of the sails. But this isn't the only factor that varies the force a light source can impart on a solar sail. A less friendly neighborhood law of physics, the inverse square law, states that the intensity of a point source of energy, say the sun, will decrease with the square of the distance away from it. This is a result of the energy spreading over a greater distance as it radiates outwards. This basically just means less photons will hit the sail the further away it is from the sun. So if a solar sail was double the distance from the sun, it would only receive a quarter of the photons, triple the distance and the sail would receive one ninth. This makes the solar sail increasingly ineffective as we travel to the outer edges of the solar system and beyond. The other primary factor that affects the force imparted on the sail is the angle at which the photons strike the sail. You can think of this like a game of pool where the angle the cue ball strikes another ball will determine the direction it travels in. Or you can dispense with the useless analogies and think of it as a photon bouncing off a mirror. The direction of thrust will always be perpendicular to the mirror and vary with the cosine of the angle of incidence. When the sail is perpendicular to the incoming photons, the incidence angle will be zero and the cosine of zero is one, and thus it will be at a maximum. Of course, the effective area of the sail also decreases as it angles away from the sun. The effective area can be found by multiplying the total area by the cosine of the incidence angle, and thus the force really varies with the cosine squared 
of the incident's angle. Putting all this theory to work, we can see how the Lightsail 2 achieved its goals. Lightsail 2 was a project by the Planetary Society, a company formed by Carl Sagan, Bruce Murray and Louis Friedman back in 1980, with a goal of raising funds for exciting missions through crowdfunding. It is currently run by my buddy Bill Nye. As you can see here, he totally knew who I was and didn't think I was just a fan nervously asking him for a photo. Eh. Lightsail 2 is a tiny craft weighing just 5 kilograms and 11.3 centimeters in width and 34 centimeters long. But when deployed, the sails had an area of 32 meters squared. This compact size allowed it to rideshare on a Falcon Heavy mission in June 2019, launching into orbit around Earth at 720 kilometers. When Lightsail 2 is moving away from the sun, it faces its sails towards the sun to maximize the acceleration. Then, as it moves back towards the sun, it turns on its side, so the solar sail isn't slowed down. But, as the Earth blocks the sun for about half of its orbit, we are only really getting thrust for about one quarter of its orbital period. This constant adjustment of orientation will make a solar sail in planetary orbit heavily dependent on reliable control moment gyros. And, as a sail grows in area, the more demanding this requirement will be, both on the size of the equipment needed and the energy required, but the technology does exist. By performing this maneuver every period, Lightsail 2 managed to raise its apogee by 2 kilometers in its first week of solar sailing. However, the lowest point of its orbit, or its perigee, has been decreasing at a faster rate, meaning the orbital energy of Lightsail 2 is actually decreasing. This is happening primarily because the spacecraft still comes into contact with Earth's atmosphere, even at 720 kilometers. Since the solar sail, by design, has a large surface area with very little mass, the small traces of atmosphere found at 720 kilometers are enough to significantly slow down the spacecraft's velocity. This drop in velocity causes the spacecraft to dip further into the atmosphere, where the drag increases, slowing the spacecraft down even more. Because of this, Lightsail 2 is expected to deorbit in about a year. This could have been mostly avoided if the spacecraft was placed into a higher orbit where it would experience more solar pressure and less atmospheric drag. The point at which these two pressures equals is around 800 to 1000 kilometers above Earth's surface, so any useful solar sail would need to be launched higher than this. Nevertheless, the increasing apogee of Lightsail 2 has proven that solar sailing could be a useful technology for future space missions, but I'm not sure why we needed to prove that since Mariner 10 did that 40 years ago. It, in the least, provided additional data and design verification for future solar sails. So beyond this not so ideal application, how could we potentially use solar sails to develop new technologies? Perhaps one of the most important could be an early warning system for solar flares. To do this, we would need a spacecraft to keep a position directly between the Earth and the Sun. Anyone familiar with Kepler's laws of orbital mechanics will know this is difficult, as any object orbiting closer to the Sun will have a higher velocity and a shorter orbital period. So it would be racing ahead of Earth. To maintain this position, a spacecraft would need to constantly push back into position and obviously propellant would pretty quickly run out. So solar sails are the perfect solution for this and they will be able to achieve more thrust the closer they get to the sun. We already have several satellites for this purpose parked in Lagrange point 1, which is the point at which the gravity exerted by Earth and the gravity exerted by the sun is the same. However, a solar sail with a 67 by 67 meter area would allow a satellite to double its distance from Earth and thus provide double the warning time at about 2 hours. This would provide Earth vital time to prepare for a solar storm and protect our satellite in orbit and our grid system. Larger sails would allow the satellite to park even closer to the sun, but we begin to run into engineering challenges as we approach the sun with unpacking the larger sail and protecting it from the sun's heat. If we had suitable materials that could be both extremely thin, reflective, light and heat resistant, we could sail even closer to the sun to perform sun diving maneuvers to capture the sun's energy to increase our velocity and explore the outer solar system. 
There are countless other applications for this technology that you can learn about with the reference material in the description, but you may have difficulty understanding them without a decent understanding of orbital mechanics. I started to read up on this subject myself in anticipation for the new Kepler Space Program game, and Brilliant's course on gravitational physics will teach you everything you need to know about Kepler's laws of orbital mechanics and much more. Or you could complete one of Brilliant's daily challenges. Each day, Brilliant presents you with interesting scientific and mathematical problems to test your brain. Each daily challenge provides you with the context and framework that you need to tackle it, so that you can learn the concepts by applying them. If you like the problem and want to learn more, there's a course quiz that explores the same concept in greater detail. If you are confused and need more guidance, there's a community of thousands of learners discussing the problems and writing solutions. Daily challenges are thought-provoking challenges that will lead you from curiosity to mastery one day at a time. If I've inspired you and you want to educate yourself, then go to brilliant.org forward slash real engineering and sign up for free. And the first 500 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So you can get full access to all their courses as well as the entire daily challenges archive. As always, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, subreddit and Discord server are below.